As I said a moment ago, we want to uh, we want to keep the emblems of the death of Christ. This little bit of bread. Hopefully, you got some on the way in, and and this cup of juice. These emblems that Jesus gave to his disciples the night before he went to the cross. He gave it to them as tools, as a means by which they might worship and remember and proclaim his death until he returns. And I would remind you that these things. These things aren't magical, and they won't save you. That is, this little bit of juice and this bread, you can ingest that physically. It will do you no good. In fact, if you don't know and love the Lord Jesus Christ, if you don't understand how these things represent his gift of salvation, forgiveness of sins, and everlasting life, then I would encourage you these things are not yet for you. They are for those who know and have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sin. But brothers and sisters in Christ, if that is true of us, what a gift we are given in this moment. Passed down to us from those first disciples. These little emblems that contain truth and grace to us. Not that the grace is inherent to these things, but the message they convey to us as we ingest these things physically, spiritually, we've gathered in this moment to feed on the Lord Jesus Christ. His body and blood, the spiritual awakening of our hearts through that gift of grace. And how desperately we need that this morning. So we want to keep our attention on these things. Have them in your hand while I'm sharing with you. And we want God's Word to speak to us as well. And primarily verses 31 to 34 of the passage I just read to you, which in rather almost cold and calculated terms, Jesus just lays out what's coming. The climax of his redemptive ministry, his saving ministry for us, his death and his resurrection. Before we dig into the details of that passage, I want to give you a sense of what's happening in Luke chapter 18. There's some important, as we've called them, theological threads or themes that have quickly emerged in this passage. Not new, we've seen them already in Luke, but they've come together. God has put them together in a unique way in this book. So I want you to see a couple of things, and then, then we'll fix our eyes for a little bit on the object of our faith, the Lord Jesus Christ. The first thing you need to know, if we're going to benefit from verses 31 to 34, is that Luke 18 reveals to us, pulls back the veil on our need of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it does so in three distinct ways. And I'm just going to give them to you quickly. We've we've seen them, some of them already. One is in uh, chapter 18 and verse 13. We have the, as Josh showed us last week, a tax collector and a Pharisee uh, praying in the synagogue area, one kind of promoting himself to the Lord, the, the Pharisee saying, look, I'm glad I'm not bad, a bad sinner like this character. And then the picture of the, of the tax collector, again, he's a tax collector, which means he's, a, he's a, a betrayer of Israel, he's working for the Romans, and he's a thief. He takes too much, more than what he is entitled to. So he was in general terms, considered a a great sinner in the Jewish community. What does he pray? Look at verse 13. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. He cries out for mercy. And then Jesus, in applying the story, says this in verse 14. I tell you that this man, rather than the other man, went home justified before God. One of the ways to understand our need of Jesus and what he describes in verses 31 to 34 is this issue of justification. Again, Josh stepped us through this passage last time. The implications, and and we need to see this in that little story there in Luke 18, both the guy who thought he was righteous and the guy who knew that he was not righteous, both of them, Jesus says, are not justified before God. In fact, Jesus' commentary is, that the man who cried out for mercy in humble repentance and faith, he received justification. He was restored into a right relationship with God, not the Pharisee. The self-righteous man is left alienated from God, broken, still indebted to God, still a sin debt against God. The great sinner cries for mercy and is justified. He He is made right with God. So that's one way that 
Luke 18, and Jesus here begins to help us unpack and get ready for this, this description of, of his death and his resurrection. We need that because we are not justified before God. None of us are, we are born into this world condemned. And we prove the justice of his condemnation really from birth, don't we? Our attitude, our hearts, our words, they reflect the fact that we don't want God to rule over us. We want to have our own say in our own lives. We are broken away from God, condemned, and what we need is justification. This is why Jesus must die and rise again. But there's a second way. In Luke 18 and verse 18. Now again, we'll come back to this passage and this important story and some of the details next time. But I just want you to see now how in this next vignette, and this is a true story, a rich man comes to Jesus and he asks him a very important question. He says in verse 18, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do to gain eternal life? How can I know for sure that I will have life that will not end? That I will have a life that goes beyond physical death and the grave? That's a good question. That's the vital question, isn't it? But you see here, we've moved from that image of we need Jesus because we're cut off from God, condemned by God. We need to be made right with God. We move to the, the realm of spiritual death. We don't have life, spiritual life. We don't have eternal life. And this man in his question, at least implicitly, is saying, how do I get that? Where do I get that? How do I come by that? And again, there's some important details. We'll come back to that next time. But I want you to see how the question of everlasting life leads us to Jesus' words in verses 31 and 34, where Jesus says, I must die and rise again. We don't have spiritual life. Jesus must go to the cross. He must suffer in our place so that he can secure for us the life that we do not have. And then there's a third way. So you have this issue of alienation and condemnation, spiritual death. That's why we need Jesus. And then in the same account, this rich man who asked this important question, Jesus makes this statement after the man goes away sad, and we'll look at that next time. He says in verse 24, Jesus looked at him, the rich man, and he said this, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Now listen, justification, being justified with God, eternal life, having eternal life in God, and entering the kingdom of God, all of those things intersect. They they are overlapping in mutually informing ways for us to understand why it is we need Jesus. And we've seen this already in Luke, haven't we? We're not citizens in God's country, in God's kingdom. In our alienation from him, we want to set our own flag on our own territory and live under our own reign. And what we need is to be brought into the kingdom of life and kingdom of light. So, to understand the significance of what Jesus says in verses 31 to 34, Keep those three things in mind. Those themes, Luke wants us to be thinking about those things when we get to verses 31 to 34. Our need of justification, our need of eternal life, spiritual life, and our need of citizenship in the kingdom of God. But there's a second thing going on in Luke 18 that gets us ready for those verses and really reaches beyond them. And that is the issue or the need for faith. Jesus is increasingly going to reveal to us in Luke's gospel account both the essence of faith, what is faith, what does it look like, and the necessity of faith. We must possess, we must express the kind of faith that brings us into justification, makes us right with God, that that gives us eternal life, that brings us into his kingdom. We need a certain quality of faith, if I can put it that way. So again, and I won't go back and read them, But in uh, chapter 18 and verse 13, we have uh, an expression of the tax collector, a genuine expression of humility and repentance. What does faith look like? What is faith in? What do we mean when we say trust in Jesus? Well, it begins with the devastation of seeing clearly our own sin and lostness and our need of someone to rescue us. And in humility... And in repentance, we turn to the God who made us and we confess we are in the wrong. Whatever else faith in Jesus is, it begins 
with that recognition that God, the only thing that God owes me is judgment. And that's why the tax collector cries for mercy. So there's genuine humility and repentance. That's, that's the faith response to Jesus that is needed. Secondly, in verse 17, Jesus describes how we have to be like little children. Again, Josh touched on that last week. If we're going to enter his kingdom, if we're going to be justified, if we're going to have everlasting life, we must receive him, his kingship, and his forgiveness. We must receive the kingdom like little children. That's very dramatic, isn't it? With the thunder and the lightning. So just, just to be clear, if I get struck by lightning and laid out here, you guys are free to go home. All right, come back for the body uh, later. I, I really hope that doesn't happen, though that would be a story to tell, wouldn't it? What a way to go. Anyhow, uh, the issue of faith. One is humility. You think you guys are distracted on that side of this equation. You should be up here in this moment. Lord, help us. Genuine humility and repentance. So keep that in view. So as you think about what Jesus says uh, about his death and resurrection in verses 31 to 34, you need to be thinking, do I understand why he had to do that for me? Is there genuine humility and repentance growing in your heart? Secondly, there's this absolute dependence and trust of a child. That's the way I would describe it. The heart of a child, even the, the wording here could be an infant, could be like a toddler that can't really express itself. We have to have the, that quality of heart of a child to receive the kingdom. And I think what Jesus is getting at is that small child is absolutely dependent on the parents. It will starve to death. It will, uh, it will be killed through the elements if exposed. It needs desperately and obviously parental care. And it's that kind of absolute dependence and trust that, that we express, that brings us into that place of justification and life and citizenship in his kingdom. And then there's a third, uh, and again, we'll come more to this next week. There's this issue of complete surrender. The rich man, and I, I could get preaching this already, so I got to be careful. But the rich man, he wants eternal life, but his hands are full. Jesus kind of challenges him in terms of his own righteousness and ultimately says to him, sell everything you have and then you come follow me. This absolute surrender, you got to give up everything if you want to receive eternal life, if you want to enter my kingdom, if you want to be justified with my father. If, let me put it to you this way, I'll sum it up this way. If you want the benefits of who I am and why I came to this earth and what I have accomplished in my life, death and resurrection, you must abandon every other hope and place all of your hope in me and in me alone. So the question of faith should be at the front of our minds when we come to share and remember and proclaim the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because if the spiritual awakening of the Spirit, if that expression of humility and repentance, if that absolute surrender to Him and that complete dependence upon Him, if that is not a part of who we are, then these things won't benefit us at all. It's hailing now, just so the people at home have some idea. I don't even know. Can you hear me? I can't hardly hear myself with the hail on my roof. Can you hear me all right? All right. I will keep going. I will keep going. In a strange way, last week, it was freezing up here. It's much warmer today. So I'll take the hail. It's a, it's a warmer place to be. You guys are really glad to be in your cars too, aren't you? You're just, you're really, uh, yeah. So... All of that, keeping all of that in view, what's happening in Luke 18, let's think for a moment about what Jesus describes, all right? So do you have those elements in front of you? Let me read the words for you again. Verse 31. Jesus took the 12 aside and told them, we are going up to Jerusalem and everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. He will be delivered over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, insult him, and spit on him. They will flog him and kill him, and on the third day, rise again. What I want you to bear in mind in this moment is we, we move from 
thinking about faith, what is it and how do we express it, to the significance, the vital importance of understanding where do we direct it? What is the object of our faith? Where do we send it? And implicitly and explicitly, already in the Gospel of Luke, we've seen our faith must be attached to Jesus. It must be directed towards Jesus. Even before we get to the end of the story in Luke, we understand that whatever Jesus is going to do at the end, that's what I need. And here, again, Luke has put this together by the Spirit for this purpose, that we might see being made right with God, having life in God, being a citizen of his heavenly kingdom, all of that is bound up with the reality of who Jesus is and what he does for us on the cross. And my faith, the only thing that it gains the benefits of all of that for me is my faith attachment to him and those things that he has accomplished. So think about it briefly with me, what he says here. Again, it's almost dispassionate. Like Jesus just pulls him aside. There's not a lot of detail. He just says, guys, and this is the third time now that he said to them in an explicit way, this is what's coming. This is why I've come. Let me just remind you of a couple of things as, again, we prepare our hearts to share in the emblems of what he describes. One, he says here, he makes explicit that what is happening is what God has planned all along. He says that he will be handed over to the Gentiles. Earlier on in Luke, he talks to them about being arrested by the Jewish leaders. Here, he brings in the Gentiles. The Jews won't be able to crucify him. Only the Romans could crucify. And he says here, the Gentiles, I'll be handed over to them. And all of this will be according to the prophets. That is, this is precisely what God had promised from the beginning. Earlier on in Luke, we won't, I won't turn there, Isaiah 4, verses 16 to 20. Jesus, sorry, in Luke 4, Jesus quotes Isaiah where he says, I've come to save, I've come to rescue, I've come to restore sight to the blind, strength, healing, recovery. It's a, a picture of the messianic recovery and rescue. And Jesus says, this passage in that, Luke 4, he says, this passage is fulfilled in me. I've come to rescue you. This is God's plan. This passage, when we pick this up, Luke 18 with Isaiah, our minds immediately go to Isaiah 53, and they ought to. The suffering servant. How will Jesus in Luke 4, fulfilling that passage in Isaiah about the great deliverance of his people from all that is attacking them, how will he do that? He's a suffering servant of Isaiah 53. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned each other to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him. And the description of the laying on and the laying into Christ in Isaiah 53 ought to bring us to tears every time we read it. Go home this afternoon and prayerfully consider the promise of Isaiah 53 that is fulfilled in Luke, that is fulfilled in the coming of Christ as he gives up his life for us. Again, simply, there's more we could say. We must understand that when Jesus goes to the cross, he knows exactly where he's going. He knows exactly what he's doing. It is the fulfillment of God's mission. Implicitly, just as a bit of an, an, an aside, but an important one, Jesus here is demonstrating to us why it is we can trust his word. The Old Testament and his word given to us in the New Testament. God keeps his promises. And the promise of salvation that will come through the one who will give his life in the place of sinners, Jesus has come to keep that promise. That is a powerful promise, isn't it? In all of the, the struggles and trials you are facing in these days, remember the promises of God in Scripture. And there are many. At the heart of all of the promises of God's presence, his comfort, his help, at the heart of all of them is the promise that God himself would die in our place so that we could have life with him forever. And he kept that promise. Jesus kept that promise. Secondly, just think for a moment about his suffering and death. He will be mocked. He will be insulted. They will spit on him. They will flog him. And they will kill him. If you go to the end of Luke, we'll be there in a while when we get to the end of Luke or any of the, of the uh, gospel accounts, and you go and read again about the, 
what happens to Jesus as he is betrayed into the hands of sinners, as he's betrayed into the hand of his creatures. He made these human beings. And this is what they do with him when he comes. In love and grace, he comes and they kill him. And the description, um, Hollywood, and even the best efforts of Christian movie makers cannot capture the physical torment and the spiritual torment that Jesus descends into as he goes up Golgotha's hill with the cross and gives his life in our place. We remember the physical suffering, but we must always remember that within that physical suffering is a spiritual exchange. You understand that he suffers physically in that moment. What he's promising to do here is to take our guilt for our sin so that we can be justified. He is, he is committed to die our death so that we can have everlasting life. He is, in a way, if I can put it like this, he is going to forfeit his rights as king of heaven so that we can become citizens of heaven. I don't, I don't even, I have, I don't know how to describe that. That love and that grace and the picture of him hanging naked on a cross, beaten and mocked by his own creation because out of love for those creatures, he will make a way for them, for forgiveness, justification for life and for citizenship in heaven. Now, I don't want you to lose that thought. I just want to finish a couple of things from the passage. We don't we got to take the whole thing, right? And these things are meaningful. I want you to hold these thoughts, the picture of his death on your behalf, in your mind as we open these packages, as we share in these emblems. But these emblems are effective in reminding us, and more importantly, what they represent is effective in actually securing our salvation because Jesus isn't dead. Is that true? Is Jesus alive? And it's the resurrection that ensures our justification. It's the resurrection that ensures our eternal life. It's the resurrection that ensures our citizenship in his heavenly kingdom. The glorious third day. He would take possession of resurrection life, everlasting life, and make this bold promise to all who will put their faith in him. If you put your, give your life to me, I will give you life for eternity. Have you made that exchange? Have you given your life to Christ? Again, the, the spiritual exchange that takes place on the cross is the, the taking of our sin and guilt into Jesus, the miracle of the gift of righteousness and forgiveness and holiness. All that is his becomes ours as we give ourselves to him in faith. All of that is possible, a reality for us in faith because of the resurrection of Jesus. Interestingly enough, the passage says the disciples still don't get it. Don't be hard on the guys in verse 34. They do not understand this. The meaning was hidden from them. They did not know what he was talking about. Don't be too hard on the guys. Don't think that we would have done any better had we been there in their shoes. There's more to ponder in that reality, and we're going to get to more of it when we get to the end of Luke's gospel account, and their eyes are open. Simply understand at this point, Jesus is describing what is coming so that when it comes and afterwards, they will better understand why that had to take place. But in the description of it, they cannot yet comprehend what is coming. So let me put it this way. They need to know what is coming so that after he accomplishes his death and resurrection, they will better understand why that took place. But in this moment, before they get there past the event, they can't, God won't yet reveal to them fully all that this means, all that it will mean to them one day. It's part of Jesus' preparation and education for them in this moment. Gloriously, we know the blinders do come off, don't they? And they do see, and they are able to proclaim the truth of this in great power because Jesus gave them this instruction before he went to the cross. But I just want to now, again, uh, get to the moment we can share in these things. As I said a few moments ago, it seems almost matter of fact the way Jesus describes them here, doesn't it? But you and I know it's not the case. He's not cold and calculated in any of this, is he? 
We will soon arrive with Jesus and the disciples at the garden. We will soon see him there weeping, as it were, sweat drops of blood as he agonizes in prayer on the night of his betrayal, as he gets right next door to the reality of his crucifixion. Jesus understands, long before he gets there, in this moment, he understands the weight of the cross that he must bear. Please see in his words here, in his promise of what he will do, the certainty of this promise. The Son of Man, Jesus is going up to Jerusalem. This will take place. Please hear in his words, his determination, his unflinching and resolute determination to rescue you and me from our sin. And nothing in heaven above or hell below will keep him from his appointed mission. He will save his people from their sin. For our forgiveness, for our justification, for our life, for our citizenship in heaven. You know, I tried to, uh, I, I thought, Lord, how do, I don't know how to illustrate this. This picture of what Jesus is promising and where it's headed and all that that means. I don't know. I really can't in this moment. There's no story I can tell. There's no human level example I can come up with that will adequately explain what it is Jesus is telling us in this moment. I just can't do it. But I did find, again, songwriters, hymn writers are a great help. And I found this helpful. Let me share this with you. See him, the song is called Jerusalem. See him, Jesus in Jerusalem, walking where the crowds are. Once these streets had sung to him, now they cry for murder. Such a frail and lonely man, holding up the heavy cross. See him, walking in Jerusalem, on the road to save us. See him there upon the hill, Hear the scorn and laughter. Silent as a lamb, he waits, praying to the Father. See the King who made the sun and the moon and shining stars. See the King let the soldiers hold and nail him down so that he could save them. See him there upon the cross, now no longer breathing. Dust that formed the watching crowds receives the blood of Jesus. Feel the earth is shaking now. See the veil is split in two. And he stood before the wrath of God, shielding sinners with his blood. See the empty tomb today? Death could not contain him. Once the servant of the world, now in victory reigning, lift your voices to the one who is seated on the throne. See him in the new Jerusalem. Praise the one who saved us. In this moment, and if you haven't already, you can go ahead and open those little packages. In this moment, I would encourage you to stop and reflect on your, whole, your own heart response to Jesus. And I, and I want to just, I just want to catch a glimpse of the, the blind man in the rest of the passage. Verses 31 to 34, they give us, this is where we're to look, Jesus and his death and resurrection. That's where we will find justification in life and citizenship in heaven. That's where it's found. The blind man, this story, I believe, is put here intentionally by the Spirit of God to again reinforce what does the faith look like that gains the benefits of his death and resurrection. Consider this blind man. Reflect on your own heart response to these truths and to the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus says at the end of his encounter with this blind man, your faith has healed you. Clearly, faith is crucial to his reception of this great blessing from Jesus. 
But remember how desperate the man is in the story. He hears that Jesus is passing by. He is a blind man. He is a beggar. He has no social safety net. He is desperate for his eyes because he is desperate for life. And he cries out, Jesus, son of David, an expression of faith that Jesus is the messianic king who can rescue him and give him his sight back. Jesus, son of David, he says, have mercy on me like the tax collector in the synagogue. A plea, a humble, repentant plea for mercy from the king. And while there are those around who would seek to shut him up, he will not be shut up. He is desperate to see Jesus. He is desperate to have his vision back. And so he continues to cry out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And he will not stop. There's a picture here of desperation, persistence. This man is as unrelenting in his pursuit of Jesus as Jesus is unrelenting in his pursuit of our salvation through the cross. Jesus, of course, turns to the man and he says, what do you want? And the man says, I want to see. And that's when Jesus says, your faith has healed you. Understand this. It's not just because he believed, as in as faith in some nebulous, vague notion, I'm, I'm a person of faith. What Jesus is saying, you have demonstrated faith in me. You have demonstrated the kind of faith that opens up the gate into citizenship in heaven, justification with God, and life forever. His faith is not the healing agent, Jesus is, but his faith is as he expresses it towards Jesus, is the means by which he gains the blessings of Jesus. Do you have that kind of faith this morning? Have you acknowledged your own sin and guilt and your desperate need of Jesus? Take a few moments now. Just quietly think and pray. Maybe you've got some things to confess in the car with your family. I don't know. Maybe there's some people you can call later, some things that you know aren't quite right in your heart. Think about your relationships, your activities this week, your mind, your thoughts, some things that maybe you need to repent of. Prepare your heart to share in these things, remembering that it's because of his death and resurrection, and it's through faith in that death and resurrection that you are justified before God. You have everlasting life. You are a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. Let's pray together. Father, I feel in my own heart again, and I thank you for this, just a real sense of unworthiness. I I really don't understand how and why you love sinners like us. When all that we are worthy of is your just condemnation, you are the kind of God who says, no, my heart, my heart is drawn towards the rescue of lost people. But we thank you, Father. We thank you for displaying again in this passage your love and grace and opening the way, the way into a new relationship justified before you, the way into everlasting life, hope beyond the grave, and the the way into true citizenship in an eternal kingdom, a heavenly kingdom. Thank you for Jesus. Father, I I need you to work in my own heart in this moment. So as I take of this bread and as I drink of this cup, Father, I just want to again acknowledge my desperate need of this gift. And I pray for my brothers and sisters. Minister to our hearts now. Minister grace to us. We give you thanks for these emblems. We give thanks for what it is they represent. And we do all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. The bread and the cup, small emblems of the sacrifice of Jesus. Eat, drink, and remember. Before we close with a song, and the gang can start making their way back up from wherever they got comfortable. Um, 
as I was thinking about faith, both the object of faith and then the substance of our faith, my mind went to an old hymn from my childhood. And I just want to close with this, and then we're going to sing a great old hymn together, a different hymn. I hope you can sing, say this prayer with me. My faith, this is a prayer, my faith has found a resting place, not in device nor creed. I trust the ever-living one, his wounds for me shall plead. Enough for me that Jesus saves, this ends my fear and doubt. A sinful soul, I come to him, he'll never cast me out. My heart is leaning on the word, the written word of God. Salvation by my Savior's name, salvation through his blood. My great physician, he heals the sick, the lost he came to save. For me, his precious blood he shed. For me, his life he gave. I need no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.